Good evening, Reedy Branch. Welcome to Bible study this week. Uh, I apologize. You have to look at me for the next half hour, 45 minutes, but uh, I know I'm not as handsome as your pastor, but I'm going to do my very best. You know, the Lord loves all of us. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe and, and your family. Uh, these are indeed trying times, uh, but I'd like to open up with prayer. I would ask you to Please keep in, uh, in your prayers um, Pastor uh, Reverend Charles Locklear and Miss Gwynn and their family over the loss of their son, and uh, Mr. Adrian Campbell, uh, his grandmother, who was uh, funeralized today as well. Um, so many in our church family who, who, who are in need of prayer, uh, all of us, if you really think about it. Uh, so let's indeed... Uh, keep each other in prayer. The pastor is well, uh, with the exception of his voice, so, so please pray for him. Uh, I know some were perhaps concerned that uh, he was sick, but um, he, he's, he's feeling fine. In fact, he's here with me uh, right now. Uh, we're swapping, swapping seats tonight, so uh, pray for both of us. Uh, let's all pray. Our great and mighty God, we come before you with thankful hearts, recognizing that even in these difficult times, you are in, in, in our midst and you are working on us. Father, you promised that you would never leave or forsake us, and we see that here even in these times. We can draw comfort from your word, from your presence. God, you are our mighty God. Those among us who are hurting as a result of loss of uh, loved ones, we pray that your hand of grace be upon them to give them what they need that no one else can provide. Most especially uh, Adrian and his family over the loss of his grandmother and uh, Pastor Charles Locklear and his wife the loss of his son. God, I pray that you be with all those who are sick and hurting and the most uh, sick of all, those who are uh, in their sins and have yet to call upon you as Savior. We ask most of all, that you would save them in your miraculous way. We thank you for hearing this prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I was unsure about what to talk about tonight. My, uh, my uh, mind kept wandering over from one, one uh, thought to another. But uh, I finally settled on this idea of what is it? What is it that we are experiencing as a result of this quarantine. And some of us are experiencing something called solitude, uh, especially those who live alone. And uh, this is an important uh, thought as a, as a believer, as a Christian, solitude. This is something that uh, Scripture uh, speaks on. So I'd like to share with you what solitude is from a biblical perspective. Solitude, first and foremost, is a spiritual discipline. Uh, you can go to the next slide. There are several spiritual disciplines that you're aware of. Uh, you're familiar with, of course, Bible reading, Bible study, Bible meditation, as well as prayer. We speak of these more than any other, perhaps, in terms of spiritual disciplines. But there's many others. And I've got a link down there below for a book on spiritual disciplines if you uh, are interested in learning more. But there are many others. Worship is a, is a spiritual discipline. Actually, worship would encompass all of these, in, in my view, uh, recognizing who God is, uh, acknowledging uh, His mighty sovereign power. That is what is, what is worship. We worship in many ways. But another spiritual discipline is evangelism. The pastor just sent a, an email yesterday, those of you that receive email, about how to, in 15 seconds, share your testimony as a, as a way to evangelize those around you. And I encourage you to do that. Look at that email. If you don't have that email, uh, talk to somebody, call the pastor or uh, someone in the church to talk about what that is. Uh, serving, our service, our Christian service to those who are in need, uh, whatever the need might be, is a spiritual discipline. Giving, our tithes and our offerings, uh, fasting, this is a spiritual discipline that we don't oftentimes practice, but it is a discipline nonetheless. Solitude that we're going to talk about tonight. Journaling, 
That's where you, uh, you record what you have learned in scripture reading and prayer. Uh, a sort of a way of writing down your communication, your conversations with God. Those things that, that you want to hold on to and remember uh, um, later on. But as I said, the spiritual disciplines tonight that we're going to focus on is that of solitude. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it might lead you to believe that solitude is a bad thing. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Uh, if you are a, a stu student of Scripture, you know this is the passage in which God creates Eve. Now, if solitude was the way that we were supposed to live our lives, everyone would be a man. Now, that's a very, very scary thought. Whether you're a man or a woman, that should scare you. The idea that every human being would be a man. But God recognized that just as he is a, a relational being, God is, 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 is all about relationship. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even in his character, his nature uh, reflects his, his, uh, his value of relationship. Likewise, we as human beings were created to be uh, in relationship with other human beings. We are relational beings. Uh, so solitude is not our default that is not how we're supposed to live our lives. And even though Jesus, more than any uh, person in the Bible, in the scripture, demonstrated uh, what solitude is. And there were many purposes he demonstrated in, in practicing solitude as a spiritual discipline. The first uh, purpose of solitude that Jesus demonstrated was to prepare for a major task. And we see... In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, an example of this, which says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Now here in this passage, this is in reference to the temptation in the wilderness. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And the key thing here is that he was alone at this time. Uh, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, but he was alone. There were no other uh, persons in his presence. And the reason for that solitude is so that he could prepare for this very, very difficult task. I mean, just think about uh, it's a miracle that he lived uh, for 40 days without, without food or water. Uh, we know that most human beings would die in three days without any water. So this was indeed a miraculous in event. But it, didn't, it doesn't take away from the fact that it required a lot uh, of spiritual strength as well as physical strength. And Jesus demonstrated this. Uh, he needed uh, this solitude uh, to practice this discipline of solitude, to prepare for this very, very major task that was, he, he was about to embark upon. The next uh, purpose of solitude that Jesus demonstrated is to recharge after hard work. Uh, we see this in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 32, which read, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Now, this is after Jesus sent the disciples out. If you read earlier in that chapter, verses 7 through 13, Jesus sent the disciples out uh, to prepare... Uh, to, to, to let people know that the kingdom was at hand. Uh, they were his witnesses. So when, when they came back, they shared with Jesus all sorts of things that had happened. They were able to cast out demons and heal the sick and, and so many other things that they're not recorded in Scripture. 
So it was a very, it was a very busy time for the disciples. So Jesus encouraged them to go away, uh, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest. So solitude, one of the purposes of solitude is not only uh, physical rest, but also a spiritual rest. I heard a pastor say, in certain cases, in certain times in our lives, the most spiritual thing that we can ever do is to take a nap. Because we have to recognize that we are physical beings with limitations. And God created us this way, and we should embrace these limitations. And one of those is that we tire, we weary. So solitude is important, not only for the body, but also for the spirit. The next example, the next purpose Jesus demonstrated in uh, practicing solitude was to deal with grief. Uh, this is a very difficult, uh, and this is oftentimes... Um, if we ever practiced solitude, it would be during a time of grief. Uh, but the particular case I want to share with you here is in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, which says, When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. Now, if you read earlier in Matthew chapter 14, you'll find that what had just happened was that John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod. John was someone that Jesus spoke very highly of. It was, after all, his uh, flesh and blood. It was his cousin. Uh, not only were they related uh, by blood, John, Jesus said that John was the greatest man that had ever, ever lived, uh, to paraphrase the scripture. So Jesus spoke very highly of John. He thought very much of John. He loved John more than, more than any of that. And because of that, he was grieved when John was beheaded, when John died. Now, when we are in times of grief, it's easy to get to go to solitude. It's, an, it's a natural thing when you're grieving to go alone, to get away from people, to deal with that grief. However, it's also very natural, very easy to get stuck in that place, that rut of being alone, uh, to, to, to wallow in your self-pity. But I know this, this might sound a little cheeky, but whenever you are grieved, whenever you are alone and you feel like you just want to stay alone and you don't want to be around anybody... Just remember Genesis chapter 2.18 that if we were indeed to be alone at all times, then we would all be men. And we know how scary of a thought that is. And we're thankful that that's not the case. We were intended to be relational beings. So even though you may be grieving for a time, uh, it is important to get out of that mode of solitude and to be around other people. The next purpose Jesus had in demonstrating solitude was before making a big decision. We see that in an example of that in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, which read, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. You know, you learn something... Uh, Every time you read scripture, and I learned quite a, quite a bit in studying and preparing for this, but this is one of the things that I, if I knew, I've forgotten. That there were many disciples that followed Jesus. The word disciple means simply a follower of someone, a follower. So Jesus had many disciples, many followers, but out of them he pulled twelve we call them disciples. They were disciples, but they were also apostles. That was a, that was a special office that those 12 men uh, were given uh, by Jesus himself. This was a very, very big uh, decision because Jesus knew that by choosing these men out, he would be marking a path for them uh, that would be very difficult we know that 11 of the 12 apostles gave their lives, their bodily lives, uh, because of their position, because of their faith in Jesus. 
And of course, the 12th, John, was tortured um, and ostracized. So, uh, and that's just a small, small part of uh, their role as an apostle. Uh, so, so this was a very big decision. You think, just think about that. Jesus is God. We oftentimes think of Jesus as, as special, but we forget that he is God. So just think in this case, in this context, Jesus is God. So he took time. God took time. He thought about, he prayed about uh, by himself what it was going to be like, who he was going to choose. This was a very big decision. So if God, Jesus, uh, needed to take time in solitude to prepare for a big decision, it also stands to reason that we, uh, as, as mere mortals, human beings, that we also need to, in solitude, consider these big decisions that we have to make, whether it be uh, treatment for um, some sickness, whether it be a career path, uh, where to attend church, what service, what ministry we're going to participate in at our church. Everything, everything we do should be bathed in prayer uh, in solitude. The next uh, purpose that Jesus demonstrated in prayer was he demonstrated, he practiced solitude in a time of distress. We see this in Luke chapter 22, and this is, this is, this is, this is a big one. Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 42. They read, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. If you know anything about Scripture, you recognize that this is an encounter. This, this, this passage is taken from Jesus' time in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was tried, uh, wrongly of course, uh, convicted and, and killed uh, on the cross. He recognized what was going to happen. Jesus is God after all. He knew what was going to happen and he knew that it would be a very, very difficult, very difficult uh, time. He was under distress. If you read a few verses later, uh, Luke, the physician, describes Jesus uh, in his distress. He sweat literally drops of blood. And we know this can happen under great distress. The little capillary uh, vessels just underneath the skin, they can actually burst. And that blood from those capillary vessels can release, uh, those vessels can release blood. Uh, into the sweat glands and you, you sweat drops of blood. This is, this, is, this, is a real, this is a real thing. This happens to those that are in great distress. Just think about Jesus is God. And even though the physical pain and agony of the cross and the torture that led up to it would have been more than perhaps any man could, could bear on his own, the greatest, the greatest pain that Jesus knew he would suffer was the separation uh, from his father. And uh, it, when you think about the idea that God is relational, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God lives in relationship. He exists in relationship even within himself. The idea that he could distance, he could separate part of himself uh, is, is, is something I can't even wrap my head around. So this was a great, a time of great, great distress. And in distress, Jesus sought solitude. Now he brought three of his, his apostles, his disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. But they just didn't understand what was going on. They fell asleep and he had to withdraw from them. Uh, even though they were asleep, he withdrew even from them uh, to, be, to be in solitude. The final purpose Jesus had, uh, we see in Scripture for solitude, is to focus on prayer. And this is the one I, I really want to home in on. And uh, an example of this is in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, which simply reads, So he, that being Jesus, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. 
This is a simple verse, and if you read around it, it really doesn't... Uh, the context here is that if you read the verses before 16, Jesus was constantly bombarded by people that wanted to be healed. Uh, if you really think about it, like I said earlier, we all have a problem. Uh, and that was no different in that day. And everybody wanted to take their problem to Jesus to be solved. But Jesus, even though Jesus is God, he took on flesh and we very well know that flesh is limited. Therefore, Jesus at that time was limited. He could not physically take care of everyone's need. Um, more than that, uh, meeting the needs of those people, the service, which is a spiritual discipline, Jesus' service to his, to his community, to the people around him, um, uh, took a lot out of him physically as well as spiritually. And therefore, he needed to withdraw himself uh, to recharge, as we saw earlier, as one of the other, ex other purposes of solitude. But here, we see in this verse, Luke 5, 16, that his primary purpose, oftentimes for solitude, was for prayer. Prayer, that is, that is the key. If we look uh, in the next slide, we see that... Uh, Jesus demonstrated morning quiet time uh, or devotional time or, or there's lots of different ways to describe this. But Jesus would wake up early in the morning, oftentimes, and go away by himself to pray. Mark chapter 1 verse 37 says, when they found him, that is Jesus, they said to him, everyone's looking for you. So I, I, you know, I can imagine uh, Jesus, the man... Uh, who lived here on earth. He was a busy man. Everybody wanted to find him. But at the same time, he was also a man that was also trying to uh, constantly uh, find a minute that he could get away by himself. Why? Why did Jesus need to get away by himself? What is this? Jesus arose early to pray in the morning. This was after all his busiest day, this particular account. Uh, in Mark, Mark chapter 1. But the purpose, the primary purpose of solitude and, and all of these different purposes, what you're really getting down to is to get alone with God, to get to a place where you, only you and God can really, can really converse, can, you can uh, commune with God. Uh, and you really can't do that with other people around. Uh, those of you that are married, could you imagine where you were never alone with your spouse? That you were constantly with children or, or other family or friends or co-workers. Could you imagine, is that a marriage where a man, where a, a husband and a wife are never alone together? It's inconceivable. And likewise, you as a Christian, your primary, perp your primary relationship the relationship that defines your very being is the relationship you have with God. And if a husband and wife have to spend time alone together, doesn't it stand the reason that a Christian must spend their time alone with God? And that's the case. Solitude is the grease uh, on that wheel that all the other spiritual disciplines um, hinge upon. Uh, fasting, prayer, scripture reading. And just, just think about all of that in the light of the fact that we in the 21st century are constantly bombarded by noise. We live in noise constantly. When I was growing up, even, even uh, many years ago, uh, I, I, not that old, of course, but, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, you would come home, you'd turn the TV on and just leave it on. You wouldn't pay attention to it. You weren't watching it. You just turn it on because it was a convenient noise box. And gosh, that's certainly the case today, right? We do those kinds of things. You know, when you're in the car, the radio is always on in mo for most people. Uh, we're constantly bombarded by noise. People, people, 
uh, things going on. We live in a very, very fast paced life. And when you consider how fast paced and how noisy our lives are, it, it highlights the fact even more so the need to be in solitude. Now, why am I talking about solitude? Why is it important? Well, we've been given a, a, uh, an unprecedented opportunity in, uh, in recent history to practice solitude. This uh, COVID-19 quarantine, uh, in my, my two cents, is that it equates to solitude. This quarantine is solitude. Uh, this is prime opportunity for you to practice solitude. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if you're not accustomed to having a quiet time of Bible reading daily, I encourage you to use this uh, special uh, circumstances that we're in to, to kickstart that, um, that habit, a uh, very positive, very good habit. Um, our very own uh, pastor, Reverend Johnny Hunt, uh, whom you all know, I heard him uh, uh, several years ago uh, get, uh, preach a sermon, and in that sermon he described his uh, habit of waking up an hour uh, in the morning uh, before his very first thing that he has to do. And he spends that hour in scripture reading and prayer. He is in effect practicing solitude, that morning quiet time. And so that really uh, motivated me to do the same. So I'm not a preacher. I'm certainly not Johnny Hunt. But what I did as a first step is that I decided every morning I'm going to wake up a half an hour earlier than I normally do. So if I wake up at six o'clock to get uh, dressed and to go to work, uh, I wake up at 530. You can do something very similar. Now, that requires a sacrifice. You can't you can't stay up quite as late as you might otherwise. And and, and really, any relationship requires sacrifice. And so a relationship with God does necessitate it requires sacrifice. So I encourage you to wake up a little bit earlier. If 30 minutes seems crazy to you, start with five minutes. Five minutes to read one verse of scripture and a short prayer. And I guarantee you, your day will be different. Uh, you will never look back on your life and say, I wish I had not spent so much time with God. If you are his child, if you're a Christian, there is, it's impossible for you to, to look back at your life and to regret spending time with God. So I encourage you, use this special time that we have. Maybe you're as busy now as you've ever been. We know that uh, certain uh, professions, our, our um, first responders, uh, physicians, nurses, they're working even more now than they, than they did before the quarantine. But regardless of your circumstances, I encourage you to use the time God has given you. Uh, in fact, all of the time is really His. We don't, we don't own any of the time. But take some time, spend it with Him alone in a quiet place. Thank you so much for uh, listening with us uh, tonight. If you have any questions about what I've talked about tonight, uh, we're going to share... Uh, I can share these notes on the uh, church app. So if you go in the app, you go to the notes section. Uh, I'll put the, these notes here. Uh, if you want the uh, references that I, that I had in here, I'll, those will also be in there. Uh, please, please pray for each other and uh, pray for your pastor and, uh, and those that I mentioned earlier who are, who are, in, who are in need. Uh, uh, extra, extra special uh, need of prayer right now. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to open it, to learn from it. We thank you for the practice, the discipline of solitude. Help us, Lord, to practice solitude each and every day with you, recognizing that our relationship with you is most important. And God, if there was one that heard this Bible study tonight that it doesn't have a relationship with you.
Help them to know that all they need to do is call upon you and they will be saved. For your word tells us this. Father, I pray that you would draw them to you in the solitude, in the quietness of the moment. God, watch over those who are sick and hurting. Heal our land, Lord, we pray of this virus. We thank you for hearing our prayer. In the loving name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. If you did decide to become a Christian, please let us know. Uh, make a comment in, uh, on Facebook or YouTube, inbox us, or uh, send us an email or a phone call. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. May God bless you.